Literary and Cultural Studies in NUI Maynooth. Um, just to explain a bit about how the meeting is going to work, my name is Vanessa O'Sullivan, I'll be the chair for, for this session. Um, and I'm just going to ask you to speak for about 35-40 minutes and then we'll bring people in from the floor for questions or comments and Luke will come in at the end just as so I'm open to answer any questions. So without any ado, I'm going to ask Luke to, to start his presentation. <coughs> okay, I'm kind of reading in the dark here. I'll speak to the images as much as read from kind of prepared paper. But basically what I'm going to try and put into some kind of perspective is a kind of maybe reframing of the Irish crisis in terms of wider paradigms in Marxism, in development studies, and in globalization. And I'm going to try and place Ireland within a set of larger shifting of tectonic plates in what might be called the world system. And the reason I'm doing this is that there are numerous accounts, and there are some extremely valuable empirical accounts of looking at what went wrong in Ireland during the crisis from within the Irish, the specificity of Ireland itself. And that is all to the good, and some of it is extremely useful to some extremely useful journalism going into the small print and who knew who and the kind of the sharp practice behind the scenes and everything. Then there's a series of books and I see Kieran here and a number of others who've written very, Pat the Kirby, who I'll be drawing on, who've written very powerful works trying to situate Ireland in a more specific way within larger global processes. But what I'm going to try and do is shift it actually one stage further back again and to argue that, in a sense, there is a kind of, and this is highly debatable, but I'm just putting it up for discussion, there is a kind of a major realignment of even what we understand as the divisions between the first world and the third world, between the developed and developing societies. And above all, that a new version of colonialism is beginning to emerge in the West itself, and that the fractures within the West are part of precisely the globalization of <coughs> capital in this late capitalist critical phase. So I'm going to argue in a sense that empire and colonialism itself are part of a process whereby those versions of domination come back within the West itself. And in that sense, the post-colonial approach to culture really needs to be extended to social sciences, to economics and history and politics, and indeed sociology. And one of the problems with the post-colonial approach is that it seemed to be bound up with the past, and it has been bound up with more classic versions of empire and colonialism. And it's kind of quarantining within literature as part of this process, or within culture generally. But I'm going to argue that, in fact, a post-colonial approach is more urgent now. In fact, it might be one of the few approaches within the academy to catch some of the processes that are taking place right now. And I'm taking as my point of departure, I mean, this wonderful, deep insight into the Queen's visit to Ireland from Metro Ireland and all this. And it had, forget history, we're here for the fashion. <laughs> and at that, the Queen's visit had said goodbye to all that. That the Queen's visit was that Ireland has finally caught up with postmodern Ireland, with commodity culture, with globalization, with a world of lifestyles, with a world of, if you like, Celtic Tiger Ireland. And one of, the one of the arguments I'm going to make is that this notion that globalization is bound up with postmodernism needs to be questioned. Globalization has more to do with postcolonialism than it has to do with postmodernism. But nonetheless, this idea that, that Keno Callaghan, a colleague in Minute, he says a relatively commonplace response to the British monarch's response, visit to Ireland was that Ireland's, sorry, was that Ireland's colonial past no longer matters history is over. The hand of history has been lifted. And that we've overcome this heritage, and that in the context of contemporary globalization and cosmopolitanism, 
suggesting otherwise amounts to an exercise in the futile and dangerous anachronism. So people who say, don't mention the war, don't mention the past, that the Queen's visit is goodbye to all that. And, that, and, the, pressure, and the Queen's visit is, part, I would say, a powerful symbolic exercise to implement that kind of mindset in the current conjuncture, all the more so as it is bound up with a, a new crisis that brings colonialism back into center frame. But no sooner had we said goodbye to all the forget history, we're here for the fashion, than, as I put it, the empire dons a new set of clothes. It's, it's fashion itself is part of the problem. It's the empire's new clothes that are part of the problem. The empire is going to appear in new vestments. This is Duke Sanders writing about the bailout. He says, standing on Dublin's Marion Street on Thursday, I could just as well have been in Buenos Aires, sorry, in 2003, Anchor in 2000, Lagos in 1989, or Kingston in 1979. And in this, this remarkable image that taken on, on Marion Street, but, but it is remarkable. I just tracked a number of these images, and almost all of these emblematic images, someone like the Bull McCabe, so, so there's, a pack, there's, a, there's a kind of a beggar in so many, and I've collected a lot of these images. This is the Troika walking by. And this image of the begging ball, this image itself gets into the international media out of thousands of images. I, have a feel, I mean, these images, Roland Barthes would call these rhetorical images that are suggesting more than simply illustration. This is the begging ball, and this is the Troika. Ireland has been reduced to the begging ball again. And Duke Sanders goes on to say, for all practical purposes, Ireland was once again the third world. The people were more pallid, well, the pale, and generally better fed. But the anger and the slogans were deadly. So was the graffito. Someone had spray painted on the side of a building, as they do all over the world, IMF go home. So he says, for all practical purposes, he could have been in Lagos, he could have been in. And of course, people say that's inflated addiction. Ireland is not in that situation. But what I'm going to argue is that, in fact, these lines, these tectonic plates have shifted, and that Europe itself is beginning to come apart in this kind of way. Europe, and I'm drawn, there's a whole range of writers, but I'm just going to give some of Robert, Robbie Shilliam, particularly, who comes out of an Africanist background. Shilliam argues that Europe is perceived to be colonizing itself and in the process destroying freedoms and democratic structures that have been hard fought for by gender politics against political question. So there's a whole series of movement in international relations with people by Shidim and then Robert Cox and others who are arguing that international, the amorality of international relations has come into the marketplace, has come into neoliberalism, and that the way the third world was treated in the past was a dress rehearsal for the way first world itself is about to implode. And all this was a laboratory for the first world to protect itself. The, the reason I put it like that is that people may know of, there's a whole debate going on in post-colonial studies in Ireland, whether Ireland was even colonized in the first place. And there is a whole school of historical thought that says Ireland was never colonized. All that came to Ireland was newcomers. Natives and newcomers, a famous book called Natives and Newcomers. And that Ireland was no more colonized than Wales was, or Scotland was, or Yorkshire was. And I'm arguing that there's an element of truth in that because something like that, Ireland, in fact, has more in common in one ways with Wales and Yorkshire. But what's happened is that the cleavages opening up, even within nations, are going to be something similar to colonial cleavages. So, the key figure is Liam Kennedy, and he never lets you down because he did a letter in the papers during the meeting, just when I was thinking about this. Where <laughs> Liam Kennedy says, he argued that Ireland has nothing in common with the third world, historically. Ireland has, was never colonized. Ireland was simply part of Europe, part of the kind of expansions that took place within Europe. But Ireland had more in common with Poland, had, which is true, had more in common with countries that were simply invaded but Ireland was not like India, or not like the Caribbean, or not like Africa. And this is the letter he had in the Irish Times on Thursday. I read with increasing dismay the comments by the three of the college, Democrat nation, 
on the economic and social crisis of conflict in Ireland. We certainly need more analysis of a current predicament. What we do not need are gross generalizations about the past, simple-minded models pertaining to the and outmoded aids to a post-colonial mentality. So Kennedy's argument is that Ireland and arguments about Irish post-colonial, Ireland needs to be aligned and firmly placed in the first world with no links and no analogies and no affinities with empire, that Ireland was simply part of the Celtic periphery. And he argues, and by aligning Ireland to Europe, one gets rid of this, he says, this post-colonial anxiety, this post-colonial edge. This is his argument. What Kennedy doesn't do is attend to the small print of Europe itself. Because while Kennedy is arguing this, writers like Hannah Arendt argued that imperialism is on a direct continuum with fascism in Europe. That fascism is simply bringing imperialist methods back to Europe. And that the empire was being used as a training ground, as a rehearsal ground for a, for a ferocity that was going to be unleashed in Europe. And Arendt's, the second volume of her book on totalitarianism, the first volume is on imperialism, and it's a, it's a powerful argument that imperialism isn't simply about economic expansion. Imperialism is about certain ways of holding the fortress in an emergency, and that emergency was about to be unleashed in Europe. And it's kind of interesting in Paul Preston's recent book on the Holocaust in Spain, when people have challenged Preston's use of the term Holocaust for Spain. But Preston is able to show in gra graphic detail how Franco, the methods that Franco used in Morocco, the military methods that Franco used that would be unconscionable in Europe up to then, were precisely what the Republican army, the Spaldron on the Moroccans, and unleashed these for the first time in Europe on a, in a way that was a, a dress rehearsal for fascism. Of course, the First World War was no children's playground, but this was a new way of killing civilians and, and, and a mass murder of civilians in a way that had not happened before. And this had come from. So the, the argument that Arendt, Arendt doesn't even talk about that, but that is really part of that Europe, the idea that Liam Kennedy has that Europe is civil war, is civility, war with civility. And meanwhile, empire and colonies are war with no holds barred. That it, Arendt said that is an illusion. And even in the post-war situation, the persistence of racism and the structural role of racism in Europe, not to mention the role of ethnic cleansing, not to mention the crisis in the Balkans, show that, in fact, this is not just over World War II. So the argument I'm trying to make is that, <coughs> in one sense, the idea that Europe means a certain kind of civil society and that even in conflict, certain criteria, which people like Ian Kennedy and others, such that, that is simply a myth. But what is happening now is that the empire is changing its clothes from militarism to a new form of economic domination. And it was Gramsci who was the first to really grasp this, because Gramsci argued that the term subaltern, which is the key term used for colonial studies, People forget that the term subaltern studies did not emerge in relation to India. It emerged in the southern question in Italy. And what Gramsci was warning about in terms of crisis, hegemony shifts to domination. And while Gramsci is lauded for being the kind of theorist of hegemony and the theorist of how parliamentary elections can contain their own form of, if you like, implicit domination, Gramsci still had domination is still there. And domination is there when hegemony fades. And he used the, the term subaltern to try and explain the relationship with northern and southern Italy. But my argument would be that, in fact, that cleavage has broken out all over Europe. And, and the periphery of Europe is now in the, is the southern question. And the, and the role subaltern comes into it very much. It's, it, Susan Watkins talks about the abjection of the periphery. She says, Irish TDs have so far internalized their, so and I like that she's, that's a very technical use of the word subaltern. 
their subaltern status that a debate on, re on designating June the 16th, Bloom's Day, a public holiday to celebrate the country's great literary tradition, was brought to a halt by a ministerial reminder that the Troika would have to be, would have to be consulted. And I love this picture of his master's Joyce. You know, I mean, as if I heard, I mean, Joyce in a famous, probably one of the, his most gifted throwaway phrases, he talked about the Irish as the gratefully oppressed. That that alone are the oppressed, but the even welcome the oppressed. And, and this would be almost the embodiment of the gratefully oppressed. That even to discuss joys, Ireland has to go to the Troika to get permission to narrate. I mean, you can imagine Joyce's response to that kind of objection. And it's that kind of objection, begging bone mentality, that in fact is at the heart of what I want to talk about. Because even Kenny himself he says, so the, the government themselves would even admit that this is coercion. Kenny says Ireland was the first and only country which had a European position imposed upon it in the sense that there wasn't the opportunity of the government. So, so the government themselves are admitting that that was standing the fig leaf of a European parliament and European elections, and EU, that this is actually a coercive form of domination. And it's against that backdrop that I think we begin to see. So I've drawn on Susan Watkins's lead article in New Left Review there in where she goes through the periphery, the, the crisis in the periphery. And she says, Europe's ol oligarchies balk at genuine political union and true democratic federation. Hence, the core state's determination to avoid the federal social responsibilities that political union would bring. Berlin now aims to tighten the Eurozone system, to defend it against the gains, to defend the gains represented for Germany, and to squeeze the clock into a more competitive system vis-a-vis -vis Israel vis -vis so what's happening is something that David Harvey talks about in the New Imperialism, and Perry Anderson talks about from another point of view. And it's namely a critique of the notion that globalization and the circulation of capital in the world system is an abstract process without any spatial temporal fixes. What Watkins argues is that no matter how abstract capital is, it still needs political spatio-temporal fixes. It, modes of accumulation are specific to particular nations, and politics is vital to this. The, the market does not just work according to its own logic. It's as good as the political decisions and the political power in different spatial fixes, as he calls it, modes of accumulation, centers of accumulation. And what is happening to Europe is precisely its disaggregation due to a new hegemon that's even an accurate word, Germany beginning to coalesce in a way that was unthinkable, even in the heyday of the European idea. And it's against that backdrop that you have got German intellectuals, most notably the most pro-European intellectual, after Habermas, Ulrich Beck, arguing that a new empire is emerging. And he, he not noted for overstatement, is arguing so he has a new book coming out, the, Ger the New German Europe. And he's arguing that the term empire is not overstated. He says, will the rescued EU, EU cease to be a European Union as we know it, and instead become an EE, a European empire with the German style? He says, not just the power structures undergone a permanent shift, instead a new logic of power has taken place. The American Europe grammar of power conforms to the imperial difference between lender and borrowing. Thus, it is not a military but an economic logic. So Beck is arguing that empire has shifted from a military uniform to precisely the fashion and the person, precisely a new mode of presentation. But it is nonetheless empire. And it is even more powerful because it can defeat it on the background <coughs> as a bold. It's not subject to the setbacks that the, that the Americans had in Vietnam or the Lamps. So he's arguing, so Beck's book is still in the, I mean, it has come out in Germany. And Beck's book, and the idea, oh, Habermas is still holding out for his notion that all is well in Europe, notwithstanding a few bubbles. And Habermas is still kind of 
centre stage in that front and is backing up. He's critiquing, of course, Merkel and the neoliberalism. But he's not doing what Beck and others are doing, arguing that there's a structural crisis of, of intractable proportions taking place within Europe. The best work on this is coming from Greece, from the Greece, the Greek intellectuals, particularly Duvinas and a number of others. Some of you are well familiar with those. This is Duvinas. The last of economic sovereignty is accompanied by unprecedented attacks on the political and legal integrity of the country. IMF and EU inspectors visit the country on a regular basis, examine their efforts. Your government capitulation is not enough, and this is what I'm talking about, hegemony giving rise to domination. The European authorities demand that all political parties should accept the new austerity measures before the next law is solved for. Surreptitiously, a new type of colonialism is emerging, in which the Brussels leads to the European side as undeserving poor, or colonial subjects to be reformed and so forth. And what started off as a metaphor, or a slightly inflated diction, actually has become more and more center stage when the full measure of the crisis precedes it. Now, it's in this context that I'm just revisiting what is understood as the post-colonial approach to cultural studies. And my argument is basically that it should be taken out of just cultural studies, important as that is, that's, I work in that area myself, and that it should be extended to take in the social sciences, particularly economics. Because contrary to the perception that the post-colonial approach, the post-colonialism looked at empire in its heyday, which it did, and looked at classic colonialism. And classic colonialism in this sense involves what is called civilization of others. And it is true, classic colonialism involved race, and it involved the others of civilization with a capital O. But that is not, strictly speaking, the full picture. The full picture is about forced entry into modernity. What classic colonialism is about, what empire is about, what globalization is about, is about coercive entry into the world system. And that has not stopped just because classic empire is over, or classic colonialism is over. So you have a range of thinkers like Anke Hultfeld and a number of others who take dominant forms of post-colonialism task over its concentration on the past, over its, over its kind of undue emphasis on the cultural aspects and not looking enough at the economic and political aspects. So says Anki Hochfeld, post-colonialism entered the lexicon of development studies simultaneously as the product of engagement with it and as contestation of globalization. That's what it's about. In the reshuffled order of the global economy, where first words have appeared in the third, in the third words in the first word. Post colonial studies opens up new windows, right? In fact, it's more relevant now. And in terms of the academy, post colonial studies emerges with the collapse of third worldism. And in that sense, post colonial studies began to rethink classic models of first world problems. And rightly, it contested this binary between first world and third world. But it made the mistake, particularly in its more fashionable variations, of thinking that because the divide was becoming more contested, thereby the third world was benefiting from this. In other words, the notion of hybridity took on <coughs> this currency. And in the notion of hybridity, between colonizer and colonized. The implication was that the colonized was being upwardly mobile. And in fact, the colonizer was benefiting from hybridity and that you couldn't, and rightly so, you couldn't use words like primitive <coughs> or pre-modern anymore. And that was all to the good. And the word primitive collapsed as an anthropological term. And even the notion of development studies was in some crisis because if development, you mean there's you can call it what you want, pre modernist So no wonder the third world paradigm began to collapse because all the terms that were used to kind of make a division between first world and third world began to be 
debatable. But having said that, it didn't follow that the first word and the third word were converging in a positive way. They were converging in a disastrous way. The first word was being dragged back into third world, into a third world emergent economy system. And it's against that backdrop that the Turkish political economist, Arif Derlik, with Hoogvent, with a number of others, are, are really trying to push the boat out in a new way into three thinkers. And they're trying to argue that the first world, third world, has broken up in the sense that now a third world is appearing everywhere, including in the West, including in nation states, and that the whole process of incorporation and inclusion is over because capitalism is in such a crisis that it can only survive by the exclusionary modes that it once used race to justify. But these have now been taken on a class complexion within Europe itself. So says Derlich, the simultaneous global sweep and fraction of capitalism undermines also the spatial order built into the neat core periphery distinctions, as in the world system analysis of globalization, the classic world system analysis of globalization, building the whole, bringing the whole world within the domain of capitalism but at the same time introducing all the divisions of that work into the very structure or destruction of the capitalist world system. Even the center here is decentered, as it represents not a single center, but a multiplicity of centers, which themselves, especially in Europe and East Asia, are subject to internal competitions and configurations. The rise of East Asia was one of clear example of why North, South, West, periphery, could no longer hold because East Asia had begun to stole, steal a march on the West, as Brazil is going to do. So the classic East, West, North, South distinction was coming under pressure. But it was only come under pressure because those distinctions were beginning to be reproduced within the heartlands itself, including East Asia, including Brazil. They were as if and, and in, most notably China, where where the the internal periphery within China, a permanent third world within China, begins to be part of a, a new configuration of capital. And Pather Kirby, in his book, Teddy Tiger Collapse, has a long riff on this, drawing from Robert Cox's in International Relations. He says, this global social reality resulting from the restructure, it's almost as if Kirby is picking up directly from Kirby's statement from the restructuring of production has changed the core periphery cleavages in the world economy from one which primarily relate to the geographical locations to ones now also described in social relations within national economies. So within national economies, first world cleavages, third world, are breaking up, are beginning to break out, which means permanent exclusion of the have-nots and the underclass. And the structural deficit aided by the IMF and the new structural adjustment programs are designed to permanently do this. Now, at the back of this is an argument which figures like Zizek argue that modernization is over. And modernization was the myth that somehow all could be included, that all boats rose at the same tide, that the third world would eventually become the first world in its own uneven way if it partook of the modernization of the world, if it took part of entry into the world system. But he but this are but neoliberalism says no. There's no inclusion anymore. What you get is, as Paddy Kirby says, you get you get sectors within each mode of national capital accumulation. And they are part of the world system and they're doing well, relatively speaking, precarious and all as it is. But the excluded are permanently excluded. And, and it could well be that instead of acting as a palliative or an anodyne, that the consumer culture as evident in the riots last year, but the kind of senseless riots at one level, what struck me most about these riots was that they occurred at the precise level of sedation of consumer culture. It, it was precisely top-end consumer culture. Precisely the people who are supposed to be sedated. Precisely the sedation itself, consumer culture, that turned into the catalyst. And while these were 
kind of reactionary riots in Sussex. What really meant was the very placebo, forget history, we're here for the fashion. It was fashion itself that had pleased, that was no longer the opium of the masses, meaning consumer lifestyles, meaning Don John Shopping Centre, meaning global, global art. It had actually failed. And behind this is an argument, I just want to finish on this with regard to the, the, the culture of the Celtic Tiger. And it's a complicated argument about the breakdown between First World and Third World. And it's advanced in these remarkable books. We, there's several who do this, but the most powerful is Robert Wilkinson's series of books on inequality, uh, The Spirit Level, and a number of others. But he's part of a whole team who argue that, and this is a major revision of classic Marxism, that it no longer makes sense to talk about <laughs> primary material needs as so called infrastructure, the economy, and then secondary cultural or psychological needs which belong to the superstructure, culture and the likes. What has really happened in the 20th century, driven by the, the Frankfurt School, perhaps first of all, by Adorno, that needs, cultural needs are intrinsic from the very outset. Cultural needs, self-image, perception, equality, self-esteem, dignity, are not add-ons. And food is only as good as the self-esteem and the dignity that goes with it. The begging bowl is not good enough for food. And that what has really happened is a whole rethinking of culture and economics. Meaning by culture, your self-image and your ability to control yourself and to express yourself and to have your voice in the public sphere. And what Wilkinson and company latch on to say, uh, to, to, to show that even though Harlem is materially far better off than Bangladesh in terms of strict material needs, there's a far higher standard of living. In fact, death rates, longevity, illness, everything is far worse in Harlem than in Bangladesh. And the reason it's far worse in Harlem is because of inequality that people perceive the injustice and that injustice brings people down more than any, not more than any, it's part of it. It's not just that you're hungry, you're hungry because of injustice. You're being shortchanged. And he argues that mental illness and addiction and substance abuse and the disintegration of your self-image is bound up with this shattering of your life world in this way. So he said, as a result, the poorest areas of the United States, such as Harlem and New York, it says, have death rates that are higher than most ages of emulation. And in fact, a lot of the book is trying to show how much poverty in the midst of plenty is more corrosive than simply so-called objective levels of material. The reason I'm saying that is that's why the bank, this argument about the bankers and, and the, the salaries they're getting, it's not to peak century, even if that was distributed, to be only a drop in the ocean. If all the bankers with the fat pensions and the fat people, if they were distributed, it might have no impact. They probably would. I wouldn't deny they would build a few hospitals, mind you. But I suppose in terms of the big picture of the economy, you think it, it probably isn't as important. But what is important is the perception. And the perception isn't just add on or grace after needs. The perception is intrinsic to what brings people down and, and demoralizes them. And, and indeed, if you like, disaggregates them in this sense. So it's that, I'm going to finish then by kind of arguing that, again, another Greek writer, Veracicus, he argues, to all extent and purposes, an economic crisis in the Eurozone ends up creating a form of neo neocolonialism within the world's most advanced democracy, the EU. And since no one can remain free when others within the border can turn into slaves, to paraphrase him, the democratic losses of the periphery soon leap back into the ground. What's really happening is that uh, what the core nation states are trying to prevent this contamination on the part of the pigs, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, Greece, Italy, from penetrating the core itself. <coughs> and in fact, the cleavage has opened up. It's that series that the core itself is strengthened, its structure, its stability. 
The democratic glass of Britain soon expanded to cover the result being that Greece and Ireland's democratic deficit soon spreads to Germany and Holland, diminishing the democratic process of the surface countries. Now, I'll just finish on this. It's, it's remarkable if you look at Irish cinema, drama, and again, this is more clear than teacher students, how much Irish, Irish film has picked up, if you like, the fallout from the Celtic Tiger even before the collapse. And one of the arguments is of the arts is that the arts are the canary in the cage. I mean, the arts, Elisar Pound says, are the antennae of the race. And of course they're the antennae, because the artists are not answerable, well, weren't up to now, to government reports and government. So the artists can go say things without necessarily having evidence for it, or without necessarily being part of a groundswell. And that's what allows the creative imagination to go ahead of the possible, to take risks, to get it wrong, or when it gets it right, it certainly is uncanny the way it gets it right. So you've got a whole range of films, kind of dystopian films about Ireland. People, 100 <coughs> Mornings is about post-Holocaust Ireland, or post-apocalypse Ireland, made by Conor Horgan. But what would it like to grow up in an Ireland in which Ireland has been reduced to social? It's, it's kind of probably too close to Conor McCarthy's um, post-apocalypse fiction, but nonetheless this is Ireland and people have been reduced to almost famine victims in their own country. Kisses is more personable and it's set in Jobstown. It's set out in the urban desert and kids coming into Dublin as if it's Las Vegas, coming into consumer culture Dublin. The first part is in black and white. It's, it's based on the Wizard of Oz. The first part is in black and white and that's Job's stuff. And then they come into Las Vegas, and Dublin looks like Las Vegas, until the kids come into it. And they think consumer culture is going to give them their dreams, and everything implodes so seriously in the city that they're lucky to get back out to Job's um, it's, it's a remarkable film. Um, savage Woods within middle class Ireland, the people who just about benefited from the Celtic Tiger. And you begin to get this new genre of implosion particularly in ghost estates. And there's a new genre of writing happened to do with what it really is like to live on a ghost estate. The problem with a ghost estate is not that it's empty, it's living it. And so, Dollhouse, which is Kirsten Sheridan's film, that's about to come out in a few weeks' time, about the house. Now it's getting into a house house. Um, but the one that has got a lot of publicity is what Richard did about crisis entering into murderous intent coming into Black Rock itself and, and how much the elite, the, the notions of a social behaviour having to do with savage, having to do with love hate, the kind of stuff that we're familiar enough with, is now percolating back into the middle class and you get a new genre of murder within middle class and, and a kind of a savage kind of breakdown of values within middle class life. And the reason is, it's easy to say, well, they had it come to them. But in effect, I think that's more to do with Robert Wilkinson's argument that deprivation isn't just about material deprivation. And the novels, people are probably familiar with Anthony Hockey's remarkable photographs of the Celtic twilight we could do without. And, and he, he, he uses natural light for these kind of half, the, the ruin, the modern ruin the notion that the ruin is no longer a romantic ruin, but is an unfinished ruin. And the notion of, so you get, photography has been way ahead. These photographs were taken before the implosion, before the meltdown. You had a number of photographers like Anthony Hahi, who already were, were flagging all is not well. Martin Craig began to do this photography in the early 2000s. I love this one, you're going somewhere but nowhere. I mean, he, he begins to notice, and you can even see the sheer, the sheer. So he begins to look at, he began to take these photographs long before the fallout. And it's almost as if the photographers were the antennae of the race. They were there before the sensing all was not wet. So Martin Craig's, Yvonne Cullivan does the same in the west of Ireland in Roscommon. She has, she has these, she has this theme of 
fences around the buildings, which are not big houses, which aren't even valuable buildings. But she, she just tracks trespassers will be executed um, or electrocuted, as they say in America. So it causes, um, tr trespassers will be prosecuted. Those who get in will be electrocuted. <laughs> that's not it. That's not it. But it's the, it's, it's, the crime it's the growth of the crime fiction genre brings this home to roost. And it's in the crime fiction genre that has actually been the, the lighting conductor. Yeah. Spearheaded by Gene Kerrigan and Ken Bruin. But it, it, there's a certain version of it that now is homing in on middle class dystopian implosion. Tana French probably has become the master of this. Her, her novels about what happens in a ghost estate. And when people lose their jobs, and they are middle class people, what murderous intent comes out. And this idea of murder in the middle classes is just uncharted ground in Ireland. Alan Lynn is another one, and I love this book, which is a collection of down these green streets <laughs> from Raymond Chandler, down these mean streets, and I must go with that and said, me, down these green streets. I, I forget that, but this is Sigmund Bauman saying that what has happened is that level of culture has to be held down to. This idea of whole, contesting it at the level of self-image, at the level of dignity, it's not just art, it's about precisely people's where we do to come out from under the shattering negative self-images that go alongside this deprivation. And Bauman's book on culture is, is a powerful thing about, about that. But I'll just finish on this, Nietzsche, saying that the periphery itself has the power to regenerate the center. But lo and behold, this is, this is Nietzsche. He says, Ireland is a case of poverty. This is Nietzsche. In any case, Gaelic offers me an exactly corresponding example of how Central Europe is and everything. And he says, the word Finn Gael, the word Finn, for example, in the name, Finn Gael, the term designating nobility and finding the good, noble and pure, originally referred to the blonde headed man, in contrast to the dusky, dark haired original habits. Incidentally, it's indeed, the Celts were a thoroughly blonde race, and here we go. <laughs> <laughs> People are wrong when they link those races to a darker population. But he said, the Irish might say of the Germans, this is what Nietzsche is saying. But, and the blonde race might say of the Germans, but if Nietzsche is your best apologist, I think we're really in a dark place. So I leave it at that. Thanks again. Thank you very much for that, Luke. Um, I just asked Kieran, can you just turn on the lights there for us? Um, Throw a bit of heat. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Throw a bit of light on the subject. Um, we're just going to open it up now to the floor for questions, comments, or anything you want to add to, to what Luke Sorry for just going on in there. No, no. Um, so Luke, you can sit back and yeah. relax there for a few minutes. Um, we'll br bring Luke in at the, the end to answer any questions or to comment himself and sum up the meeting. So if you just want to raise your hands, if you have any. Okay, I just, uh, just apologies first of all, I have to rush off, I have to uh, start uh, I, I, I want to uh, just first of all agree with Luke on uh, challenging the idea that we live in a certain cosmopolitan world where you know, all this business of empire is gone by and you get all this stuff typically around referenda on the fiscal street and stuff like this, yeah. But I also want to just take issue with a few points. Uh, so just me, first of all, to where I think I agree with the post point analysis. Uh, first of all, there, are, first of all, capital, as, as he said, doesn't just wander around the world. It needs particular locations, and those locations color how the capital operates, and in particular, links up with states. And what is absolutely glaringly obvious in Ireland at the moment is there's a hierarchy of states. Uh, sorry, in Europe, there's a hierarchy of states. The German state, you know, if you like, imposes its will. Uh, on others, so I think there's no, there's no disagreement on that. Nor is there any disagreement on the idea that, if you like, some of the techniques of rule that were used in the third world, the developing world, by the IMF, the Troika, are coming right back home. You know, and usually these techniques amount to, you know, here's the framework you have to operate. You can choose, but you have to come to come within these measurements. That type of techniques that are used throughout the world. But there are there are a few difficulties with post colonial analysis. Just just to push across, right? The first, just make the obvious point, the first is, uh, 
Well, first of all, the empire. Well, well, first of all, which empire, right? There are different empires, there are different conflicting interests between, for example, Germany and France and so on. So it's not a homogenous empire, there are different conflicting empires. But even if you look at it in terms of, let's say, the EU has imposed something on Ireland. Now, that's an interesting question. I mean, did, did the EU impose, if you like, this economic policy in Ireland? And the answer, yeah, of course, yes. They set out to rescue the European banks. Therefore, they impose certain economic policies in Ireland. But were the Irish ruling class totally victims of this process, or were they involved in a similar strategy? And this is where the post scenario analysis has a big gap. I would say, when it comes to imposing a chunk of the Irish wealthy, so therefore, one of the reasons why they do it, yes, they get orders from Brussels, but they also want to save their own skin. So it's important, in terms of any analysis, we look at the class divisions in Ireland, and particularly the role. So otherwise, you, you end up saying, and you often get this, for example, in Greece, the problem is Germany. The Germans are this, that, and other to us, right? Well, of course we know the German elite are, but so are the Greek elite. And of course the German elite are doing it to Ireland, but so are the Irish elite doing it to Ireland. Okay, so that's one issue, right? The second issue, just on the point, just maybe just leave it on two issues, on the post colonial issue, is one of the problems I find is the, the perennial question, well, why aren't the Irish protesting? And I've heard this from Kathleen Lynch and so on. The argument is, because of the post-colonial mentality. Now, you see, there, there are elements of culture, legacies of culture that do impact in any society. And if you like, the, the groveling elite and the sort of respect for the gentleman and so on, all of these things are around. But to simply explain it by a post-colonial mentality, it doesn't deal with the specifics. Like, for example, what was the role of social partnership? How were union leaders co-opted? And more importantly, if you think it's a post-colonial mentality, it's stopped with the Irish protesting. Jeez, we're in real trouble because they ain't going to be ever protesting if this legacy is so strong. So you need to, I, I think, instead of looking for a post colonial mentality, certain features and so on, you need to, if you like, look at the more specifics. And very lastly, it is difficult to map it in terms of simply of colonization, you know, a, a strategy of colonization. I think there's unevenness to the hierarchy of state, but when we look at the periphery, well, some of them were empires, uh, Spain and Portugal, right, were empires. The Spanish state, is still involved in massive exploitation in Latin America, right? Uh, in terms of the, its investments in Latin America and so on. So for me, I think there are elements of, a certain, well, I, the term I use is imperialism, by that I mean a hierarchy of states, and within that fight against imperialism, there are class differences within the uh, uh, countries that have been colonized before. Those class differences are enormously important. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah, I, um, in, in many ways you were making, you know, putting forward two uh, well, two presentations and so on. One, you know, the argument about taking, if you like, the sort of better concepts of cult cultural studies into the economic sphere. And the second one, which you finished off with, was the cultural response over the last four or five years. And if just say, uh, uh, ask you a few questions on that. You see, yeah. Even in terms of what you presented uh, as the response over the last four or five years, what I think is interesting is that very much it's um, the traditional Irish culture has not managed to respond. I mean, the real weakness is the uh, you know drama, poetry, uh, the uh, the literary novel has not responded, has not caught up with the change in circumstances. I mean, where the real, even as you drew attention to, has been in film and photography, not a cultural arena that is classically associated with Irish, with Irish culture. And secondly, again, almost an entirely new genre in Irish literature, the crime novel. It's the crime novel that's actually uh, right up to date in its intervention in, uh, in in, in, what, in, in what's happened in the development of Irish society over the last years. Um, and so, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know what I'm really trying to say on this, except that I, I, I do think it's interesting, and I know Fintan O'Toole has written extensively on, particularly on drama, the way it, you know, what, what we see as traditional Irish culture just hasn't managed to say anything about what's happening in Irish society today. It's as if it's caught in its own time wall. But it's the new it's the new arts that that are saying something about it. 
that, that, that's a, that's a clear point. Very soon. I'm just going to bring yourself and then yourself back in. <coughs> that was a, a fascinating talk and enormously wide ranging. We could have covered uh, from about 73 different points. But just, you see, I, I detect a little bit of heart and neighboring what you're saying, which is this idea of empire dissolving the nation into this, into this swirling sea of, of kind of corrosive substances that you describe. And I completely agree with you about the significance of it's, it's trying to do that, but, but I'm not sure it is doing that. But there is a problem for capital, which is that um, the instrument for the creation of new hegemonies, because you, you talk about the dissolution of hegemony, I don't quite buy that, but I also think that um, uh, what we have instead is a struggle for a new hegemony, a struggle for dominance again. And the instrument of that of that struggle, the instrument for the imposition of, a, of some kind of new shared identity, some kind of new space in which the differences are dissolved, in which class is momentarily denied, the instrument, there's not a better instrument than the state yet created to do that. Um, uh, kind of anticipating a little bit of what I'm going to say, if you look at Latin America, for example, what you have is the, is the generation of new, um, of states which, which whose starting point is a challenge to hegemony, but whose end point is the creation of a new one. Because in the end, uh, the world's working class, which does exist for all its multiple divisions and, 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 and veils and masks, um, is, you know, it can, can be controlled from the state. The, 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 the world system can't control, contain, direct, or, or repressed workers, and therefore the state is not it's far from disappearing, I suppose that's what I want to say. Yeah, just, I'm going to just bring the last two speakers in before I bring Luke back, okay? Um, so just yourself, she hasn't spoken before, so. Uh, okay, yeah, I would just wanted to make a few minor points, actually. Well, judging from the title, A Culture in Crisis, actually, um, this was kind of more of a theoretical, sociological thing. And I understand in the English language, the word culture has a, a different extra meanings than it might might have in other languages. I was actually ex kind of expecting you to comment on what the state does in time of crisis to culture itself, like budget cuts and what kind of decisions it makes. And getting into the post-colonial terminology, that was really interesting. I didn't expect that. But I still wanted to understand the viewpoint, the practical viewpoint of what the state does to culture to change it. Because you mentioned it before that uh, certain initiatives are being killed, except that usually in Hollywood, anti-capitalism is fine. And in other cultural areas, still trying to commercialize or commodify it, still a different way of approaching it. Yeah, just to come back to that. You know, I mean, there are links between the three responses. And I'd say one of the links is something probably the, maybe the opposite. The other side of what Kieran pointed out is Kieran was pointed to the state as a comprador state, the state as simply a gatekeeper or facilitator of globalization. <clears throat> but the other side of that is the state as a site of resistance to that. And that becomes a very difficult issue, the state as a site of resistance. But one of the ways in which that has important consequences is, come back to your question, something that is a very difficult issue, and that is about state funding and the arts. Because there's a lot of good work, and there's a very contested debate about whether the withdrawal of state funding from the arts is a good or a bad thing. Because there is an argument, going back to what Paul was saying, that in some senses state funding of the arts has not been without strings attached and that and that one of the muzzling the kind of i'm using that term sedation kind of generally but the kind of the sedation of irish culture in the last 15 years hasn't just been due to dundrum shopping center or to commodity culture or lifestyles it's due to that public funding of the arts has been more and more controlled to bodies and to decision makers and to, and the question is whether that is a good thing or well, obviously that part is bad, but then it doesn't, so the argument about state funding, some people say, well then the less state funding the better, we can come out from under 
the shadow of state funding, but I don't agree with that. I think that the state is not a one-way traffic, and the state is always a contested state. And, and the areas most contested is precisely at the level of what it produces by way of funding with the arts, because it's precisely the arts are one of the few spaces that are not and cannot be policed by definition in the same way. Of course, you can get crap art, well, fair enough, if you want to do that. But if if you want, being, it's one of the arguments of the Frankfurt School that the the autonomy of the aesthetic will be the last thing to go because everything goes if that collapses. So the arts, notwithstanding the funding by the state, and I think that's a very interesting question. What, so looking at the funding of arts councils, of arts officers in particular counties, looking at community centres, I think we really need to know. And I think a lot of the resistance, including the mobilisation with the pussy riot, pussy, riot, the pussy rioters are exactly using agitprop and are using avant-garde artistic techniques, which would be double Dutch in one context, but really are galvanic in another context. They brought the whole might of the state into it for a kind of series of symbolic acts. So the, the pussy writers would show the sheer power of a symbolic act, notwithstanding the vulnerability and the, the lack of popular support. They generate, they don't wait for popular support, they generate popular support. And I, and I think that's that's what I mean by the arts going ahead of, the, that's not the business of the, the popular, the role of the artist to generate that popular content. And that's what I mean by conscious, and not just reflecting, I take your point about where is the agency of history, but, what, but it's not the purpose just to reflect. Agency is about production of consciousness as much as reflection of consciousness. And on that lofty note, I think we can talk about it.